Welcome to the Belly Button Window Channel and Episode 25, Part 1 of the Jimi Hendrix story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we commence the deep dive into August of 1968, including the concerts and itinerary associated with the second North American tour, the ongoing recording work for the Electric Ladyland album, and much more. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to related videos, performances and stunning photographs from the period, as well as Hendrix books, recordings and merchandise. By the summer of 1968, the experience were now almost exclusively a stadium rock band, rarely appearing in front of less than 5,000 people. But, as crowds increased and the exhaustion of almost two years of non-stop touring took its toll, Jimmy became less inclined to be subservient to their demands and began toning down his performance. Even though he had always maintained that the choreography was always spontaneous, he realized he had made a rod for his own back. Kathy Etchingham says of his dilemma, he started to hate his image. He would sit at the end of the bed almost in tears, trying to explain to me how he felt, how he was fed up with his stage act, and what people expected of him. It is also notable that Jimmy complains of fatigue frequently in interviews, and as a result we start to see lackluster performances and even antagonism towards some audiences. Thursday the 1st of August, and the Jimi Hendrix experience perform at the City Park Stadium, New Orleans, Louisiana, partial set list for the concert Red House, Purple Haze, Foxy Lady, and Wild Thing. On the same day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the underground publication, the word ungarbled. Manly Miller of New Orleans related the following story. August 1st, 1968. My mom is 19, sharing an apartment in the Marigny with a girlfriend of hers. Jimi Hendrix is going to be playing that night at Tad Gormley Stadium in City Park, but he misses his flight from Shreveport, so they've got to drive to New Orleans. They get to town a little bit early, so they go to Beauregard Square to join a love-in that's taking place. So Hendrix is out there on the flatbed of a pickup truck, talking to all these hippies at the love-in, and my mom and her friend met him and his entourage. He invited them to the concert, and they invited him to an after-party at their house afterwards. They got backstage because they had met him and he gave them backstage passes, but they never really expected him to show up at their after-party. But lo and behold, here comes Jimmy with his entourage. My mum and her friend were just blown away that he was just a regular guy, so they did what everybody did back then. They smoked a lot of weed, drank a lot of wine, and popped some acid. The following is a review of the City Park Stadium concert by Howie Roman. Everyone who has ever been to a Jimi Hendrix concert has his own story about what, why, and how Jimi Hendrix did whatever it was that he did. City Park Stadium is not the perfect place for a concert. In fact, it is a wretched place. It is much too large. The audience at City Park, though they were not free, were polite and appreciative. Hendrix dug the audience and let us know it. He did a lot of talking, which is something he normally is not too fond of doing on stage. He also put on a full performance, including humping amplifiers and sticking his tongue out at little girls with cameras. Besides all his playing, he played some awful heavy guitar. Red House, to me, was the highlight of the evening. Due to the fact that this song is not available here, I was not aware that Hendrix can be a blues singer. Mitch Mitchell and Noel Redding also showed us that they too can play the blues and not just loud psychedelic music. I'm not putting down the Jimi Hendrix experience's psychedelic music, I really dig it. They did plenty of it at the concert, and they did all of it well. The closing song of the evening was Wild Thing. I'd never heard Hendrix do Wild Thing, and had always felt that it was one of the worst pieces of crap ever recorded. Hendrix turned the trog's mess into the wildest composition I've ever heard. This was where he got into eating the guitar and humping the amps. Besides these antics being a blast, they created fantastic sounds that really shook up your head. The Jimi Hendrix experience turned out to be just that, with Hendrix turning on City Park Stadium and delighting all of us. Hendrix turned out to be one of the most relaxed and yet frantic performers I've ever seen. All in all, it really was a great concert, and a wonderful time was had by all. Friday the 2nd of August sees the group performing at the Municipal Auditorium, San Antonio, Texas. Set list for the show, Purple Haze, Fire, Foxy Lady, Hey Joe, Red House and Tax Free. An excerpt from a review by Richard Tedhams, The Jimi Hendrix Experience played at the San Antonio Auditorium. Although the Jimi Hendrix Experience concert was ultimately moved forward, they were naturally fantastic. 
They played eight songs in total, about 30 minutes for six dollars. And Hendrix really did everything with his guitar. He made undulations. He played with the microphone, with his hands, his elbows, his teeth, his buttocks, his knees. He played behind his back, above his head, on the floor, between his legs, and right and left. On the same day, the experience is featured in the underground newspaper, The Great Speckled Bird, August 2nd, 15 edition. Saturday, the 3rd of August, sees the group performing at the Moody Coliseum, Southern Methodist University, Dallas, Texas, set list for the concert. Dear My Fantasy, Lover Man, Foxy Lady, I Don't Live Today, Hey Joe, Fire, Red House, Purple Haze, and Wild Thing. The Jimi Hendrix Experience were also featured in the publication, RPM August 3rd edition. According to Noel Redding, in Texas we asked for a drink and were told it was a dry. That was it. Forget it. We flat out refused to play without drink. Finally, a police car pulled up outside the gig and we were taken outside. We were getting a bit nervous. Texas had a terrifying reputation for locking you away for life for possession of a joint. The boot opened and inside was as close to a full bar as you could imagine. The following is from a Dallas concert review written at the time. The Coliseum was filled with lots of beautiful people with their bells, beads and Nehru shirts, not to mention their appropriately subversive buttons, and who cared if SMU's personal Gestapo were rudely ordering people on the lower floor to get drinks and cigarettes the hell out of there. Listen, kid, the floor's just been waxed for basketball season, you understand? Who cared if Grady Newton the University Park's top meter maid and part-time narc, and his SS troopers carried cans of chemical mace at all times. It was a rock concert, a time of love and joy, a time of... Get the hell away from the stage, kids, or... Anyway, lots of dope had been consumed, so who really gave a damn? Jimi Hendrix and his two sidemen came onto the stage and were greeted by the standing, screaming, shouting crowd... Hendrix and his men launched into two songs that have not yet been released on record, and the crowd grooved along with them. The next song, a lesser-known one from their first album, Hendrix dedicated to our soldiers fighting in Washington and Detroit, and to the American Indian. Now Hendrix was removing his Fender guitar and replacing it with a small, fine-quality Les Paul Gibson guitar. And Jimmy did the blues. Jimmy became the blues. It was Red House, a number that was on the British Are You Experienced album. Jimmy was trying to show his audience that he was a musician and not just a show-off spade. The audience said, play fire, on do purple haze. But Hendrix didn't want this to be another Jimi Hendrix golden hits night, and said so, adding that they were experimenting. He started to do a Dylan number, but the goddamn PA system was sure to make the lyrics fuzzy, so he decided not to do the Dylan thing. Then he said to hell with it and started pleasing the crowd. He does Foxy Lady and The Wind Cries Mary and Hey Joe and Fire. And yes, Purple Haze with a bit of wild thing thrown in for good measure. And the crowd went wild. Yells and screams pierced the air, and everyone was feeling good. Jimmy launched into Wild Thing with a bit of destruction shtick before it was all suddenly over. And the SMU mace-carrying pigs roughly escorted Hendrix off stage because he'd gone over his time limit. And besides, there might be a riot, which would make it a first in Dallas rock concert history. The cops reasoned. Sunday the 4th of August. The group is interviewed by radio station KSMK Houston. Then later that day, the experience performs at the Sam Houston Coliseum, Houston, Texas. Set list for the Houston concert, Red House, I Don't Live Today, Spanish Castle Magic, Fire, Voodoo Child, Slight Return, Purple Haze, and Manic Depression. Monday, the 5th of August. The experience flies from Houston, Texas, heading back to New York. On the same day, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the underground publication, Courier Bucks Count, August 5th edition. Tuesday, the 6th of August, in the evening at the Scene Club, Jimmy participates in a jam session with members of the band, ten years after, flautist Jeremy Steig, Larry Carell, and Mitch Mitchell. Wednesday, the 7th of August, saw the Jimi Hendrix experience return to the record plant, where they are believed to have worked on the song Long Hot Summer Night, while that afternoon, the group did a photo shoot sitting on the Alice in Wonderland statue in New York Central Park with photographer Linda Eastman, the future Mrs. McCartney, and photographer David Seigel. The photos taken were intended to be used on the cover of the forthcoming double album, Electric Ladyland. Jimmy wanted one of the color shots from this photo shoot to be used for the cover of his upcoming album. 
having provided a specific outline of the album's design to Warner Brothers Records. In relation to the photo shoot, Linda Eastman recalled, the kids had no idea who Jimmy was, and we picked them at random from the park. Thursday, the 8th of August, and the experience is featured in the underground publication, known as The Rag. Saturday, the 10th of August, and the group performs two shows at the Auditorium Theatre, Chicago, Illinois. Setlist for one of the performances was Are You Experienced, I Don't Live Today, Fire, Red House, Foxy Lady, Purple Haze and Wild Thing. On the same day, the experience is featured in the following music magazines and newspapers, Melody Maker and Rolling Stone for their respective August 10th editions. Sunday the 11th of August sees the experience perform at Colonial Ballroom Davenport, Iowa to an audience of 3,500. The concert set list, Are You Experienced, Lover Man, Tax Free, Foxy Lady, Red House, I Don't Live Today, and Fire. Bob Carmody provided this memory of the Davenport gig. The place was packed, and the doors were open to let people watch from outside. Kids were standing on the tables on the sides of the floor to watch this musical magician dazzle us with his remarkable gift of making the guitar an extension of his hands. A person couldn't air guitar that good, he said. We sat on the floor in the middle of the colonial with our jaws dropped as Jimmy played, and he even played a bit longer than he had planned saying in an interview afterward, I didn't know the people in Iowa would dig me like they did. It was a night I'll never forget. Monday the 12th of August, the experience depart Davenport, destination John F. Kennedy Airport, New York City, arriving at 6 p.m. Then, off to the record plant, working on recordings for Room Full of Mirrors with harmonica player Paul Caruso present at this session. Thursday the 15th of August, and the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in The Scene, Evening Independent Newspaper. Friday the 16th of August, and the group performs at the Merriweather Post Pavilion, Columbia, Maryland, setlist for the show, Are You Experienced, Lover Man, Foxy Lady, Hey Joe, Fire, I Don't Live Today, and Purple Haze. Also on the 16th of August, the Jimi Hendrix experience is featured in the underground publication, The Great Speckled Bird, published in Atlanta. Saturday the 17th of August sees the experience performing two shows at the Atlanta Municipal Auditorium Atlanta with the Amboy Dukes, Ira Apparent, Vanilla Fudge and Soft Machine as opening acts. Partial set list for the second concert included Fire, Red House, Purple Haze, Wild Thing and Star Spangled Banner. On the same day the group is featured in articles appearing in the following music magazines Melody Maker August 17th edition and New Musical Express with the article Jimmy Goes Great. August 17th edition. The following piece appeared in the Great Speckled Bird publication. There is a concert, a rock concert with several serious new music groups, and advertising that promoted only the top 40 dribble that some of the groups produce. Five groups play the afternoon show. The Ira Apparent introduced the show. The Soft Machine do a long powerful riff with the drummer stealing the show. The Amboy Dukes really get into it and steal the entire concert. The Jimi Hendrix experience leaves most of the audience cold. The audience leaves Hendrix cold. He finishes the show. The evening show is much the same, except the Amboy Dukes do not appear, we are told, because of time considerations. Rumours fly. Hendrix was outperformed earlier in the day, so he gets insurance against that for the evening. No Amboy Dukes. Hendrix plays again, and again many people are disappointed, not without cause. He didn't really try. Man, it's only Atlanta. Where's that? What is it? However, he plays his ass off on Little Red House, a blues thing unlike the head tunes that made him famous. Nothing freaky, just great music. He gets polite Atlanta applause. He does Purple Haze, and the crowd is pleased. He plays Wild Thing, the Star Spangled Banner, etc., smashes his guitar and amp, and leaves the stage with the audience getting at least a few minutes of what they seem to want. Then there is an interview. Hendrix sits on the 21st floor of the Regency Hyatt House, and does not want to be interviewed as he watches Joe Pine freak on the tube. We begin slowly. Phones ring. Doors knock. The rest of the band comes in. Bird asks, How was the afternoon performance? Hendrix answers, I didn't feel really up to it, you know, because we were pretty tired, very, very tired, as a matter of fact. We just got straight off the plane and came over here, had free time for about an hour and a half. It's just like having recess in school. The first show is a drag, it was a bore. 
The people were waiting for flames or something, and I was waiting to get through to those people by a music way. I'd like to see anyone come to a show, but don't forget we're trying to get it across. Who wants to sit on a plane eight days a week and come down and see people's faces saying, are you going to burn your guitar tonight? What's that shit about? Just because we did it about three times in 300 gigs? Bird asks, do you get much into what's happening with black people? Hendrix answers, I don't get a chance, man. I'm not thinking about black people or white people. I'm thinking about the obsolete and the new. Some people weren't made to live together anyway. All that's more personal type of things that comes out in riots and frustrations and so forth. It's so screwed up. Everyone's like sheep now, almost in America. Bird asks, Did you dig the covers you've had for your albums? Hendrix answers, All that's completely in the past. Bird asks, What are you going to do for the new one? Hendrix answers, Well, we have this one photo of us sitting on Alice in Wonderland, a bronze statue of it in Central Park, and we got some kids and all. First I wanted to get that beautiful woman about six foot seven, Varushka. She's so sexy you just want to hmm. Anyway, we wanted to get her and have her leading us across the desert, and we have like these chains on us, but we couldn't find a desert because we was working and we couldn't get a hold of her because she was in Rome. Then Bird asks, A lot of people aren't sure about that interview thing on the second album, that spacey interview. And Hendrix answers, We just felt like saying it. You're really going to be disappointed when you hear our first track on our new LP, because it's like, when the gods made love, and it's, you know, maybe I should play it. Can I play it for you? Sunday the 18th of August, and the Jimi Hendrix experience perform at the Curtis Hixton Hall, Tampa, Florida. One critic wrote, Hendrix looked very tired and acted angry at the crowd. It seemed that Hendrix thought the audience was far behind him. At the end of one show, he brushed aside the stunned audience, chastising them for taking photos during the show. It's a shame you spent all that money on one photo, the guitarist told the crowd. I thought you were coming for sound. Still, when Hendrix clicked, it was hard to deny his talent. When he played, the roof collapsed, the walls shook, and the floor shook. When it was all over, you wondered what had happened. The following review, titled Hendrix Experience Was Tame Show, by William W. Jablin appeared in the Petersburg Times, August 20th, 1968. The Jimi Hendrix Experience, billed as the most progressive rock act in the world, gave a less than sparkling performance before 7,000 young fans at Curtis Hixton Hall in Tampa Sunday night. Interviewed before his performance, Hendrix gave the impression of being very weary. Speaking in almost a whisper, he complained of the length of his almost continuous two-year tour. I've had almost no private life at all in the two years we've been on tour, he said, as he slouched in front of his dressing room mirror. We haven't had a practice session in almost four months, he added. The obvious weariness carried into his performance. As Hendrix's experiences go, this one was rather tame. The audience greeted him with screams and banners, but this fervor seemed to generally subside. Hendrix concocted the wild cacophony of sound, blasting and bombastic for which he's known. He also played his guitar in only the way Hendrix can, from indescribable positions, working the guitar for every note and screech of sound possible. Yet throughout his performance, he never really seemed to excite his audience to the degree he's supposed to be able. He had said before the show that, if the audience really digs us, we'll play harder. If not, we won't try as hard. In other words, he wouldn't try and win an audience. He did not work hard Sunday night. Perhaps a malfunctioning amplifier which plagued him throughout his performance did not allow Hendrix to fully concentrate on his music. Only in two songs, Hey Joe and Manic Depression, did the audience get anything that resembled the real Jimi Hendrix experience. The Hendrix experience is supposed to bring an audience to feel the frenzy of the wild electronic sounds that marks his underground beat. It is supposed to bring body and mind to the crescendo of involvement with the ever-increasing wild beats of the supercharged electric pulse and throbs of the guitars. The audience seemed to sense this feeling for these two numbers, but then it was lost. Perhaps that was why the Hendrix part of the show only involved about eight numbers, and why many of the 7,161 were leaving the audience during his last number, Wild Thing. Both Hendrix and audience were suddenly very weary. Tuesday the 20th of August sees the group performing at the Mosque, Richmond, Virginia for two shows, 7.30 p.m. and 10 p.m. with support acts, Ira Apparent and Soft Machine. According to the Richmond Times Dispatch, he was dressed for last night's mosque concert in bell-bottom cerise pants. He also wore an exotically embroidered vest over a black shirt, two belts, 
one wide and gold, and three ornate rings. His carefully clipped hair stands high and round like a topiary tree. Hendrix, who taught himself guitar by listening to old rhythm and blues artists, has put that style of music aside. Instead, he has originated a music of his own, using amplifiers and electronics as a part of it. The result is a lot of noise and harsh sound, but listen carefully, and there are some startling musical effects emerging. His musical understanding is shown in the intricate figures he weaves on the guitar, often holding the instrument tight against his chest, as if he were a human resonator. At other times he is strictly a sensational showman, as when he swings the guitar between his legs, or lifts it high and seems to chomp on it like an ear of corn. All the time, he keeps playing, never losing the thread holding the song together. When the amplifiers are lowered and the music emerges a bit more, one realizes that Hendrix is playing blues and protest songs, as much as he is fiery, possessing ones. He dedicated I Don't Live Today to all the self-appointed soldiers in St. Petersburg, Chicago, Vietnam, and oh yes, the American Indian. The song ends in a special effect like a catcall. His Red House blues displayed his original harmonic technique around the old jazz form, but his version is a squalling, wailing blues. The lament is there, but it is shriller. In fact, if the music is representative of Hendrix's own soul, then his soul seems to be shrieking and demanding a place in the sun. And this review is by Jan Bridge of the J.R. Tucker High School. The Hendrix style is a jangling concoction of funky, heavy-beat rock soul, a touch of Little Richard, a pinch of violence, several dashes of erotica, and serves with a plentiful topping of intentional amplification and feedback. The mosque stage Tuesday night was well stocked with speakers, amplifiers, and a confusion of wires, the lifeblood of the Hendrix group. Hendrix, a 23-year-old Southpaw, sported a right-handed guitar with the strings reversed, instead of a mere left-handed instrument. This is the easiest way to do it. Besides, it's the right way, he said of his backwards guitar. Violence and eroticism in the unique Hendrix style has moved several critics to name the experience as successors to the Rolling Stones, the bad guys, of earlier rock. Although Hendrix's success has thus far been short-lived, he said Tuesday that he was tiring of the novelty. The whole deal was fun at first, he said. Now it's no longer fun. The travelling and the rush is really getting boring. That concludes this instalment of the series. Stay tuned for the next episode, where we will continue the deep dive into August of 1968 of the Hendrix story, continuing with the second North American tour, along with the ongoing Electric Ladyland recording sessions, plus the day-to-day -day details and anecdotes relating to Hendrix's extraordinary life. Don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. And by the way, if you have any stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you, or you have any questions or feedback, let us know. Until next time.